to love and serve God. Please open your Bibles today to the book of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, this morning my message is entitled, Together We Disciple. The Great Commission is recorded in every gospel and in the book of Acts. You know the most important thing about you is your relationship to God. And here we find our mission. We find our purpose of why God has left us here on this earth. Would you please stand with me as I read from Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. May we pray. Our Father, we're so thankful that we can be in your house with your people. We can celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. I thank you for those that have been saved, that want to be baptized today. May you add great blessings to them and their families. I pray if there be one here today and they're not certain of where they will spend eternity when they die, God, my prayer is that their hearts would be open. They would be good soil hearers, as Jesus said in that parable of the sower. I pray that they might hear and believe, whether they be here or watching online at home. God, I pray for salvation to come to hearts. I pray, Lord, for each Christian. Strengthen us in the faith that our cups might be full and running over to praise our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. People are passionate about all kinds of things, aren't they? Uh, Take, for example, today watching sports on TV. How about watching the home team play today? Let's say watching football or baseball or basketball or hockey or soccer or cricket. I think I had you until the last one, right? (laughs) Years ago, I was reading the Township Newsletter at dinner. Uh, The Upper Providence Township puts out a letter uh, every quarter, and I, I said, can you believe it? They're considering building a cricket field at the Upper Providence Park. And one of my little kids said, that's great, we love crickets. We catch them at recess every day. (laughs) Everyone is passionate about something. Watching the Super Bowl tonight, catching crickets at recess. Uh, Maybe yours is playing golf or baseball or basketball or tennis. Maybe it's fishing or hunting, watching QVC, watching those cooking shows. How many like watching cooking shows? I'd rather eat it than watch it. Uh, Watching those home renovation shows, you enjoy it, you learn something, you buy things, you spend money, it's just a lot of fun. You know, God, God is seeking people who are passionate about him, about following him, about learning about him. And for a Christian, for Christians, doesn't it make sense that we would get excited, that we would get passionate about what Jesus says is our number one priority? Well, sure, it makes sense. So what does that look like? What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? There in your notes, I have the question, what does it mean to follow Christ? It means to receive God's gift of salvation and forgiveness. You and I are made in the image of God. That means we have emotion, we have will, we have intellect. We will live forever somewhere. This separates us from the plant and animal kingdom. We are eternal beings, originally made to have fellowship with our creator God. But our first parents, they sinned. And when they sinned, they plunged the human race under the curse of sin. Even the world, even creation is affected by it. We bear the scars of sin in nature. That's why there are earthquakes. 
That's why there are tornadoes and hurricanes. In fact, on page two of your notes, you see that Romans 8.22 says that the whole creation, the whole creation groans in pain together. That's for now. But one day, Jesus will return to earth. He said, I will come again. And when he comes, he's going to remove the curse and the lion and the lamb will lie down together. And you and I will live forever somewhere. Jesus taught us that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. Hold your finger here and turn back two pages. Matthew chapter 25 in verse 46. Now, if you have a red letter edition in your Bible, what does the, the red letters mean? Who said that? Jesus. Jesus. Now, all the Bible is inspired by God, but if it's in red, it came from Jesus. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You see, whether you believe that there is life after death or not does not change the truth that it is a fact. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He took the penalty of our sin. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead and he offers the gift of heaven to all who put their faith and trust in him. But people need to be humble enough to ask God to forgive their sins and to trust Christ alone for salvation, to have this personal relationship with the living God. Not only does he promise a home in heaven, but he promises to come and be with us. We just read that. He comes to be with us, and God's quiet presence comes and gives us a peace that passes all understanding. God's quiet presence comes and gives us a joy that is daily and never-ending. God's quiet presence comes and comforts us even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and we lose loved ones, moms and dads, husbands and wives, sons and daughters. Christians, we mourn and grieve, but grief does not consume us. Why? Because we will be reunited with our loved ones. Listen to what he says here in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 in your notes. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Here in Matthew 28, Jesus meets with his followers before ascending at the Mount of Olives. Scholars believe that, that he must have given appointed time and that, that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul said that over 500 people at one time saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. I'd say that's pretty good evidence in court. Can you imagine having 500 witnesses that saw Jesus alive? Now we know in this particular instance, if you go back to verse 16, the 11 disciples are there, but in verse 17 it says that some, when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. And so that implies there are more than the disciples there. There are more, and that could be that time when 500 appeared. Uh, he appeared before the 500. What did he say to them? What is this great commission? Or verse 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And that phrase is a command, make disciples. So what is the great commission? It is to make disciples, make followers of Christ. Jesus has all power and all authority. That means he is the master of the universe. Uh, there's an old song that says it won't be old Buddha sitting on the throne. It won't be Hare Krishna. Not Joseph Smith, not Mohammed. It's my Savior and your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Great Commission is one command, make disciples and all, uh, of all nations. The way we do that is with three actions or three gerunds, going, baptizing, teaching. Now going, that's inviting people to Christ. That's go and share the gospel with others. We're not to wait for them to come to us we're commanded to be able to go to them. And then secondly, baptizing. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, I once heard a famous preacher on the radio say, baptism is insignificant. Baptism is unimportant. Unimportant? To who? It was pretty important to Jesus to make it part of the Great Commission. 
He said, my true disciples, number one, are saved. My true disciples, number two, are baptized. And my true disciples, number three, continue to learn the Bible. So three important truths about baptism. Baptism is for believers. So we call it believer's baptism. Number two, baptism is a step of obedience, not a step of salvation. Baptism has never saved anyone. Baptism does not wash away sins. I, I baptized people now for some 38 and a half years, and not one time when someone got baptized were their sins washed away. Never happened. Never happened. You check whatever Bible you want to check. You check a Protestant Bible. You check a Catholic Bible, uh, King James. You check uh, uh, the cult Bibles. When you get to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, they all say the same thing. I've checked it out. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. And so the message from God is that salvation's a gift, it's free, we receive it by faith, it's not by good works, church membership, baptism, uh, helping others, being honest or sincere will not wash away sins. Baptism's a step of obedience. And number three, baptism is by immersion. Many of us were sprinkled or poured on as infants or children. Hey, our parents did the best they could with the information that their churches gave them. Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? The answer is no. No, the thief on the cross could only do one thing. He's gonna die in a couple of hours. He could believe on Jesus Christ. He saw the sign, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. He saw the character of the Lord when he, said, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And a spiritual light went on and he said, this is the Messiah. And so he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Lord, meaning God, kingdom, meaning he's going to be resurrected. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He could do one thing, believe on Jesus, and he did, and he died, and he went to heaven. He went to heaven unbaptized. Baptism doesn't wash away sins. It is by immersion to picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The third thing there is teaching, teaching to observe all things that I have commanded you. So, who is a disciple? A disciple is someone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. A disciple is someone who is baptized by immersion after their salvation. The Lord Jesus makes it very clear that, that individuals are to make the decision themselves to be baptized. Someone doesn't make that decision for them. Now, many of us have wedding rings on. I have a wedding ring on. On Jan uh, June 15, I almost messed it the first service. Yeah, I better get it right. <laughs> On June 15th, that lovely lady that sang that song this morning, she slid this ring on my finger. Now, I, I wear a wedding ring. I am married. Uh, now, you don't have to wear a ring to be married, but if you are married and you wear a ring, you're, you're sending a message out, and that message is, I belong to her, and she has one on. Do you want to hold it up? And she belongs to me. When you get baptized, it's like putting on a wedding ring. You're telling everyone, I belong to Jesus, and Jesus belongs to me. I'm taken. Uh, I'm not going to go pursue any other saviors. I'm not going to pursue any other beliefs or doctrines or religious books. I'm all in for God. Romans 6, 3, and 4. And know ye not, so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3, and 4. So when you get baptized, you picture Jesus dying, being buried, being raised again. Another picture. My old life is dead. I have a new life. My new life is in Christ. Jesus is my master. And the Bible is my authority for faith and practice. And then thirdly there, a disciple is someone who is continually learning God's word, becoming more like Christ in their life. So how do we do that? How, how do we learn the word of God? Well, we read the Bible for ourselves, personal Bible reading and study. God nighttime devotions. We attend worship services like you're doing today. Bible studies, adult Bible fellowship, Wednesday nights, Sunday nights, Christian books and podcasts. Make sure they are sound teaching. Sound teaching. And then one-on-one -on -one 
Discipleship Lessons. Sequoia Personal Discipleship Lessons. And so today, I'd like to be able to have you hear a testimony of those who have been through it. Moses had his Joshua. Elijah had his Elisha. Paul had his Timothy. Jesus had his disciples. The discipler is the teacher or the reviewer of the lesson there to highlight points, there to answer questions, and the Timothy is the learner, the student. And so I'd like Dina Hoskinson to come at this time. Uh, She'll share a testimony as a discipler, then we'll have a Timothy testimony. Uh, Dina and Joel have been in church since 1987 when they were married, and so been faithful for many years. We'll use this microphone here, and she and her mom both have been, been disciplers. Each one of my Timothys was at a different stage in their faith, and I never once felt awkward because I couldn't answer one of those questions. The lessons anticipate their questions ahead of time, and on the rare occasion that they did have a question that I didn't know the answer, I would simply write it down and tell them the next time we met, I would get the answer, and then I'd run home and Google it. (laughs) You may feel the commitment to disciple is overwhelming. It is not. With all of my Timothys, we never finish the lessons quickly. None of us busy ladies had 13 consecutive weeks uh, free to to do discipleship. However, the longer meandering time of discipleship helped build strong relationships. In our Ladies' Wednesday Night Bible Study, we are learning this week about creating a lasting legacy, and we are being challenged to think of what kind of legacy we want to leave behind. About nine months ago, I went to lunch with someone my mom had discipled here years ago at VFV. This sweet lady was backslidden for many years and recently repented and returned to church. She said that while she was backslidden, she could hear my mom's voice in her head, and she recalled the things my mom had taught her during discipleship. It was instrumental in bringing her back to the Lord. Mm. That's the legacy I want to leave. I want to continue to be a part of helping others through the discipleship program. Amen. Let's thank Dina. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dina. Je- Janine Harris is going to come at this time as well as a Timothy. Uh, Dina has been my secretary for over 30 years, and I-, I heard in the early service when she didn't have an answer, she Googled it rather than asking me. <laughs> What's up with that? But uh, glad she's been discipling and helping others. Janine, Janine had a family event. She was out of town. She came back special just for this. So if you want to share this quickly, thank you. Been hearing today, I wish to strongly recommend our church's A to Z discipleship program. Let me tell you why. By God's grace, on the unforgettable morning of Good Friday of 2017, I discovered my unclaimed gift of salvation. My treasure was sitting in plain sight in the comments section of an internet post titled, It is Finished. Yes, I am living proof that God uses all means. But it wasn't until 2020 that I would come to know more fully the transforming nature and staggering value of the gift I had grasped by faith three years earlier. What changed? In 2020, 
at the strong urging of a dear Christian friend, the only Christian in my orbit at the time, I joined a church, this church, and was baptized. Shortly after, I entered into the A to Z discipleship program under Susan Aylstock, an exceptional teacher and servant of God. I heeded the biblical advice of my friend, my friend gave me out of obedience to my Lord and Savior. When one has spent 58 years enslaved by the power of sin, glimpsed the awful cost of it borne by her creator and savior, been forgiven all through his blood, it is proper and it is fitting that she says yes to her Lord. Or in the words of young Samuel, Lord, here I am. And my, how God rains down blessings on his children when they obey him. Yes. After my conversion in 2017, I was yet a weak Christian, dull of hearing, lacking discernment, a lamb out of the flock, without the word of God, and without Christian discipling. Once I joined this church, took my rightful place in the body of Christ, and started in the discipleship program, I began to experience the magnificent light and power of God's Holy Spirit. For this new convert, the A to Z Discipleship Program was especially instructional spiritual food. It launched me at long last into reading the Bible, memorizing scripture, introduced me to Christian doctrine, history and theology, and some of the great Christian giants of old, including Jonathan Edwards, whose resolutions and advice to new converts I now carry in my purse to read when I have an idle minute. The A to Z program offers a rare opportunity of Christian fellowship and one-on-one -on -one Bible study with a skilled teacher equipped to correctly handle the truth of God, even with Google and without her pastor. <laughs> and if you're as fortunate as I, after you complete this course, your excellent teacher may even agree to continue on with a one-on-one -on -one Bible study with you. My sincere gratitude to Pastor Aylstock and Susan and to any others who have given their time and talents to develop and maintain this excellent content and administer this program. And thank you, thank you to all my brothers and sisters in this body of Christ who have raised your hands, said, here I am to our Lord's call to make us disciples for Christ. Thank you for preparing yourselves and giving your hearts and time to train and stand up new believers like me. Let's thank Janine. Thank you so much. The Great Commission, going, baptizing, teaching. Discipleship covers some everyday topics and gives what the Bible teaches about those topics. Let me just give you a sample of a couple of the things that we cover. Assurance, A, assurance. Uh, what if I don't feel saved? Why do I have doubts? If I sin, will I lose my salvation? I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. What are those answers? Trials, why does God allow trials? In John 9, the disciples asked the question, Master, who did sin, this man uh, or uh, his parents, that he was born blind? We'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, is God punishing me for my sin? Does God lovingly correct or spank his children? How can suffering help us? How can I help hurting people? Pastor Elstock shares the riveting story of his wife's, Susan's brother, how he fell hiking. At the age of 21, Scott Mitchell became paralyzed. How could God use this tragedy for his glory? In the next slide, the Holy Spirit. What is my spiritual gift? Uh, there is a shape booklet that will help you identify the best and most joyful way that you can bless and serve others. Q, questions. Many of them, but what about racism? What about prejudice? Uh, where did the nations come from? How did the different physical features emerge? And then the lesson on God, how to have a, a God nighttime, the best way to study the Bible. So who can sign up for discipleship? There in your bulletin, you're gonna find a little card, and on this card, uh, you can sign up. Uh, who is discipleship for? If you are a new Christian, if you are a newcomer to Valley Forge Baptist, if you're a Christian, you've been saved for years, maybe decades, but you've never been discipled, you can sign up for discipleship, discipleship lessons. But please, only sign up if you're willing to make the commitment 
for the 13 weeks or 13 lessons. You won't do it in 13 weeks. 13 lessons. Uh, your discipler will pick seven lessons and you can pick uh, s- uh, six of the lessons as well. It's a flexible program. So don't worry about, uh, well, I'm not sure if I can meet every week. They'll be flexible with you. But if you want to sign up, sign up in this card. Drop it off at the coffee shop. There's a basket there. Drop it off at the basket that's up at the, uh, uh, at the welcome desk. Discipleship, there in your notes, is for every Christian. But if you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never been saved, if you've never been born again, if you've never made a commitment to become a true and genuine follower of Christ, that's the first step. Baptism is is the second step. Growing and studying God's word is the third step. May we pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for all that you do for us in providing salvation in Jesus Christ. And I pray that each one here today might have that confidence and that assurance and that peace in their heart that when they die, they'll go to heaven. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed as we come into God's presence and show respect to our neighbor. I I have a question for you this morning about eternity, about salvation. Do you know for certain that if you died today that you'd go to heaven or do you have some doubt? If you have that assurance, if you have that peace in your heart, if you have a Bible reason that you know that when you die you'd go to heaven, you remember a time that you called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I'm not asking you if you know the date, but you remember that time you knew you could not go to heaven with the sin that's on your heart and you called upon the Lord, believing and trusting in Christ alone. If that is your testimony today, would you simply raise your hand all over our congregation? God bless you. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I I think I'd go to heaven. I hope I'd go to heaven. Oh, but I have doubts. I don't have that assurance that you're talking about, but I would like to have it today. And I feel a tugging in my heart I want to give my life to Christ today to be saved. I want to be born again into the family of God and have this living relationship with God. I'm not asking you to get baptized. I'm not asking you to join the church. I'm asking you to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior because you believe he's the son of God. You believe he died for you and you believe that he is alive and he will forgive your sins. If you sense that tug in your heart, would you say yes to God? Would you pray with me now as I did as a teenager years ago? You can pray silently. God will hear the prayer of your heart. Pray with me now. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. Please save me today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you just prayed with me, may I say to you, welcome to the family of God. I'd like to pray for you this morning. I'll not embarrass you or call you out. I just want to pray that you will begin to experience this peace, this assurance we talked about. Anyone at all, just raise your hand. You say, Pastor, I just prayed with you. God bless you. Anyone else, I pray with you this morning and I meant it from my heart. Just raise your hand for a moment. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else, today was my day. I prayed and called upon the Lord to save me. Father, thank you for your great grace and power you have displayed today. Bless these folks with your assurance. During this invitation hymn, Christian, would you pray and ask God to let you create a legacy, a legacy of impacting others to love you, to follow you, to be your salt and light by how you live, by how you talk, your attitude. An attitude of Christ likeness. I fall the part, you're the one that guides my heart. 
Father, we thank you for your great love and power to save us, to give us your joy and peace, a promise of heaven. We pray now that we will walk in your truth. We'll leave a legacy of Christ for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.